Chapter 11 Gandhi goes to jail. There was nothing passive about Gandhi. He disliked the term passive resistance. Following the collective vow at the Imperial Theatre, Gandhi offered the prize for a better name for this new kind of mass yet individual opposition to government unfairness. Maganlo Gandhi, a second cousin of Gandhi who lived at Phoenix Farm, suggested Satyagraha, firmness in a good cause. Gandhi amended it to Satyagraha. Satya is truth, which equals love and Agraya is firmness or force. Satyagraha, therefore, means truth force or lobe force. Truth and love are attributes of the soul. This became Gandhi's target, to be strong not with the strength of the brute, but with the strength of the spark of God Satyagraha, Gandhi said, is the vindication of truth not by infliction of suffering on the opponent but on oneself. That requires self-control. The weapons of the Satyagrahi are within him. Satyagraha is peaceful. If words fail to convince the adversary perhaps purity, humility and honesty will. The opponent must be weaned from error by patience and sympathy, weaned, not crushed. Converted, not annihilated. Satyagraha is the exact opposite of the policy of Anifarainifarainifarainai which ends in making everybody blind. You cannot inject new ideas into a man's head by chopping it off. Neither will you infuse a new spirit into his heart by piercing it with a dagger. Acts of violence create bitterness in the survivors and brutality in the destroyers. Satyagraha aims to exalt both sides. Gandhi hoped that if he practiced the Sermon on the Mount, Smuts would recall its precepts. Satyagraha assumes a constant beneficent interaction between contestants with a view to their ultimate reconciliation. Violence, insults and superheated propaganda obstruct this achievement. Several days after the spiritual baptism in Satyagraha at the Imperial Theatre, the Transvaal government released Asiatic women from the necessity of registration under the Black Act. This may or may not have been a result of the new Indian movement, but Indians felt encouraged by the success of Gandhi's tactics. Before confronting the government with Satyagraha, Gandhi thought it desirable to go to London. Transvaal was a crown colony. The king could, on advice of his ministers, withhold royal assent from legislation. Accompanied by a Muslim soda water manufacturer named H. O. Wally, Gandhi sailed for England. It was his first visit since his Shaila student days. Now he was the vocal lobbyist. He interviewed Lord Elgin, the Secretary of State for the Colonies and Mr. John Morley, Secretary of State for India and, like many champions of causes before and since, addressed a meeting of MPs in a committee room of the House of Commons. It gave Gandhi special pleasure to work with Dadabai Naroji, the Grand Old Man of India. Dadabai, as everybody called him, was president of the London Indian Society for more than 50 years, a teacher of Gujarati in University College, London, a past president of the Indian National Congress Party, and on July 6, 1892, at the age of 61, was elected to the British Parliament as the Liberal member for Central Finsbury by a majority of three votes. Before the poll, Lord Salisbury, the British Prime Minister, had said, I doubt if we have got to that point of view where a British constituency would elect a black man. The jibe gave that to buy his seat and fame. As a student in the inner temple, Gandhi once sat, reverent and silent, at the feet of that Dubai. Now, autumn 1906, Gandhi and that Dubai were associates in a political enterprise. Throughout the six weeks sojourn, Englishmen assisted Gandhi in winning friends, arranging meetings, licking stamps pasting envelopes, etc. Their generous cooperation led him to remark that benevolence is by no means peculiar to the brown skin. When the ship on which they were returning to South Africa stopped at the Portuguese island of Madeira, Gandhi and Ali received a cable from London announcing that Lord Elgin would not sanction the Transvaal anti-Asiatic bill. In the next two weeks on board the ship, Gandhi and Ali were happy, they had won. It transpired, however, that Lord Elgin had employed a trick. He had told the Transvaal Commissioner in London that the King would disallow the registration ordinance. But since the Transvaal would cease to be a crown colony on January 1, 1907, it could then re-enact the ordinance without royal approval. 
Gandhi condemned this as a crooked policy. In due course, Transvaal set up a responsible government and adopted the Asiatic Registration Act to go into effect on July 31, 1907. Indians stigmatized it as the Black Act, morally black, aimed at black, brown and yellow men. Gandhi, who was light brown, often referred to himself as black. Gandhi confidently told the Indian community that even a crooked policy would in time turn straight if only we are true to ourselves. The Indians prepared to offer Saudi Agraya. Uneasy, Prime Minister General Boda sent them a message saying he was helpless. The white population insisted on the legislation. Therefore the government would be firm. So would the Indians. One Muslim, Ahmad Muhammad Kakalia, apparently speaking for many Saudi Agrahis, said, I swear in the name of God that I will be hanged but I will not submit to this law. Some Indians took out permits under the act, but most did not. A number of Indians were accordingly served with official notices to register or leave the Transvaal. Failing to do either, they were brought before a magistrate on January 11, 1908. Gandhi was among them. He had attended the same court as a lawyer. Now he stood in the dock. Respectfully he told the judge that as leader he merited the heaviest sentence. Judge Jordan unobligingly gave him only two months simple imprisonment without hard labor. It was Gandhi's first term in jail. Gandhi recorded this jail experience in an article printed at the time. The prison authorities were friendly, the meals bad, the cells overcrowded. Gandhi went in with four other satyagrahas. From notes kept in prison with his customary meticulousness. He knew how many joined them each day and the figures are reproduced in the published account. By January 29th, their number had risen to 155 Gandhi read the Gita in the morning and the Quran, in English translation, at noon. He used the Bible to teach English to a Chinese Christian fellow prisoner. He also read Ruskin, Socrates, Tolstoy, Huxley, Bacon's essays and Carlyle's lives. He was happy. He believed that whoever has a taste for reading good books is able to bear loneliness in any place with great ease. Indeed, he seemed to regret that his sentence was so short for he had commenced to do a Gujarati translation of a book by Carlyle and of Ruskin's into this last, and, I would not have become tired even if I had got more than two months. Reading and translating were interrupted by a visitor from the outside. He was Albert Cartwright editor of the Johannesburg Transvaal leader and a friend of Gandhi. He came as an emissary from General Jan Christian Smuts. Cartwright brought a compromise solution drafted by Smuts. Smuts's proposal required the Indians to register voluntarily. Then the Black Act would be repealed. On January 30th, the Johannesburg chief of police came to the jail and personally conducted Gandhi to Pretoria for a meeting with Smuts. The prisoner, in prison uniform, and the general had a long talk. Gandhi wanted assurances of the repeal and he stipulated that public mention be made of the Indians' resistance Smoot said, I could never entertain a dislike for your people. You know I too am a barrister. I had some Indian fellow students in my time. But I must do my duty. The Europeans want this law. I accept the alterations you have suggested in the draft. I have consulted General Boda and I assure you that I will repeal the Asiatic Act as soon as most of you have undergone voluntary registration. Smuts rose. Where am I to go? Gandhi asked. You are free this very moment. What about the other prisoners? Gandhi asked. I am phoning the prison officials to release the other prisoners tomorrow morning. It was evening and Gandhi did not have a copper in his pockets. Smuts's secretary gave him the fare to Johannesburg. In Johannesburg Gandhi encountered stormy opposition. Why was not the act repealed first, before registration? Indians demanded at a public meeting. That would not be in the nature of a compromise, Gandhi replied. What if General Smuts breaks faith with us? They argued. Asahi Grahi, Gandhi said, bids goodbye to fear. He is therefore never afraid of trusting the opponent. Even if the opponent plays him false twenty times, the Satyagrahi is ready to trust him for the twenty-first time for an implicit trust in human nature is the very essence of his creed.
Optimism about human nature was the starting post of all Gandhi's activities. It sometimes made him sound naive. His optimism sprang from a belief that man can change his temperament, can control it although he cannot eradicate it. God has given him no such liberty. Change and control, therefore, require constant effort. Smutes had made the point that unless Indians in the Transvaal registered, there would be no check on Indian immigration, and the state might be inundated with unwanted Asiatics. Gandhi accepted this and told the public meeting that voluntary registration would indicate that we do not intend to bring a single Indian into the Transvaal surreptitiously or by fraud. Gandhi took into consideration the pressure on the government from race-prejudiced whites. Therefore he was ready to accept voluntary registration. But he objected to compulsory registration by statute because a government must treat all citizens equally. He did not want Indians to bow to force. That reduced the dignity and stature of individuals. On the other hand, Gandhi explained to the meeting, collaboration freely given in view of the opponent's known difficulties was generous in hence ennobling. Smutes had withdrawn the compulsion from registration. That changed the entire situation. A giant path in from the wild mountains of northwest India near the Khyber Pass stood up and said, we have heard that you have betrayed the community and sold it to General Smutes for 15,000 pounds. We will never give the fingerprints nor allow others to do so. I swear with all as my witness that I will kill the man who takes the lead in applying for registration. Gandhi's book on Satyagraha records this charge for posterity. He defended himself against it and declared, despite the threat, that he would be the first to give his fingerprints. Then he added, death is the appointed end of all life. To die by the hand of a brother, rather than by disease or in such other way, cannot be for me a matter of sorrow. And if, even in such a case, I am free from the thought of anger or hatred against my assailant, I know that that will redound to my eternal welfare, and even the assailant will later on realize my perfect innocence. The audience listened in silence. It could not have foreseen a nearly fatal assault in the immediate future or the death of Gandhi, 40 years later, at the hands of a brother. Gandhi arranged to register on February 10th, the first to do so. He went to his law office in the morning as usual. Outside he saw a group of big pathans. Among them was Mir Lam, a client of Gandhi's, six feet tall and of powerful build. Gandhi greeted the pathans, but their response was ominously cold. After a little while, Gandhi and several companions left the office and commenced walking to the registration bureau. The Pathans followed close behind. Just before Gandhi had reached his destination, Mir Lam stepped forward and said, Where are you going? I propose to take out a certificate of registration, Gandhi replied. Before he could finish the explanation a heavy blow struck Gandhi on the top of his head. I at once fainted with the words Hey, Rama, oh, God, on my lips, reads his own account. Those were his last words on January 30th, 1948, the day he died. Other blows fell on Gandhi as he lay on the ground, and the Pathans kicked him for good measure. He was carried into an office. When he regained consciousness, the Reverend Joseph J. Doak, a bearded Baptist idealist, was bending over him. How do you feel? said Doak. I am all right, Gandhi answered, but I have pains in the teeth and ribs. Where's Mir Lam? He has been arrested with the other Pathans, Doak said. They should be released, Gandhi murmured. They thought they were doing right, and I have no desire to prosecute them. Gandhi was taken to the Doak home, and the wounds in his cheek and lip were stitched. He asked that Mr. Chamney, the registrar for Asiatics, be brought to him so that he could give his fingerprints without delay. The process hurt Gandhi physically. Every movement was painful. Chamney began to weep. I had often to write bitterly against him, Gandhi declared, but this showed me how man's heart may be softened by events. Gandhi remained under the tender care of the godly family for ten days. Several times, Gandhi, feeling the need of comfort, asked Olive, the little doak daughter, to sing lead, kindly light. It was one of his favorite Christian hymns. After recovering, 
Gandhi indefatigably preached loyalty to his registration settlement. Castor Bai and the boys had worried about him after Mira Lam's attack. Gandhi visited them at Phoenix Farm and spent most of the time there writing for Indian opinion in explanation of his compromise with Smutes for voluntary fingerprinting. Many Indians followed Gandhi without really agreeing, and he tried to convince them. What was Gandhi's embarrassment, therefore, when Smutes refused to fulfill his promise to repeal the Black Act? Instead, Smutes offered the legislature a bill which validated the voluntary certificates, but kept the compulsory registration law. Then why did Smutes now reintroduce compulsory registration? To insult us, the Indians said. To stress our inequality. To force us to admit our inferiority. This, Gandhi declared, is one of the virtues of Satyagraha. It uncovers concealed motives and reveals the truth. It puts the best possible interpretation on the opponent's intentions and thereby gives him another chance to discard baser impulses. If he fails to do so, his victims see more clearly and feel more intensely, while outsiders realize who is wrong. The Indians now decided not to register under compulsion and defy the ban on immigration into the Transvaal. For the impending contest with the government of the Transvaal, Gandhi commenced to muster his resources. His law office at the corner of Rissick and Anderson Streets in Johannesburg had now been converted, largely, into a Saudi Agraya headquarters. It consisted of two small and meagerly furnished rooms, an outer one for a secretary and an inner one where Gandhi worked amidst photographs of his ambulance unit, of Mrs. Annie Besant, and some Indian leaders, and a picture of Jesus. Gandhi also had an office at Phoenix Farm, and he spent more time there than before because he needed the support of the natal Indians who far outnumbered the 13,000s of the Transvaal. At the farm, he led a chaste, frugal, Spartan existence. Except when it rained he slept in the open on a thin cloth. He eschewed all material pleasures, and concentrated on the coming battle. Asadya Grahi, he said, has to be, if possible, even more single-minded than a rope dancer. To the Johannesburg office and Phoenix Farm came a steady stream of Indians and whites. Gandhi's circle of friends was large. He attracted people and they usually remained loyal to him. Olive Schreiner, author of the story of an African farm and dreams, was one of Gandhi's best friends in Cape Colony. Love was written in her eyes, he said. Though she came of a rich, distinguished and learned family, she was so simple in habits that she cleansed utensils in her house herself, and did her own cooking and sweeping. Such physical labor, Gandhi helped, stimulated her literary ability. Color prejudice was repugnant to her. She lent her great influence in South Africa to the cause of fairness to Indians. So did her brother, Senator W.P. There you are, the Indians taunted Gandhi. We have been telling you that you are very credulous. At a charitable and objective mood two decades later, when Satya Kreya in South Africa was published, Gandhi asserted, it is quite possible that in behaving to the Indians as he did in 1908, General Smuts was not guilty of a deliberate breach of faith. But in the heat of the battle, in 1908, Gandhi contributed articles to Indian opinion under the caption, Foul Play, and called Smuts a heartless man. The Indian community's temper gradually rose to fever pitch. A meeting was called at the Hamidia Mosque at Johannesburg for 4 o'clock in the afternoon, August 16, 1908. A large iron cauldron resting on four curved legs was placed. See conspicuously on a raised platform. The speech is finished, more than 2,000 registration certificates collected from the spectators were thrown into the cauldron and burned in paraffin as a mighty chair went up from the brown throng. The London Daily Mail correspondent in Johannesburg compared it with the Boston Tea Party. The issue between the Indians and the government was now joined. Under the smith Gandhi compromise, most of the permanent residents registered voluntarily. Thereafter, any Indian discovered without a registration certificate would be subject to deportation as a new, illegal entrant. The compromise thus stopped immigration, and that was the original purpose of the Black Act. Then why did Smutes now reintroduce compulsory registration? To insult us, the Indians said. 
to stress our inequality, to force us to admit our inferiority. This, Gandhi declared, is one of the virtues of Satyagraha. It uncovers concealed motives and reveals the truth. It puts the best possible interpretation on the opponent's intentions and thereby gives him another chance to discard baser impulses. If he fails to do so, his victims see more clearly and feel more intensely, while outsiders realize who is wrong. The Indians now decided not to register under compulsion and redefy the ban on immigration into the Transvaal. For the impending contest with the government of the Transvaal, Gandhi commenced to muster his resources. His law office at the corner of Rissick and Anderson Streets in Johannesburg had now been converted, largely, into a Saudi Agraya headquarters. It consisted of two small and meagerly furnished rooms, an outer one for a secretary and an inner one where Gandhi worked amidst photographs of his ambulance unit, of Mrs. Annie Besant, and some Indian leaders, and a picture of Jesus. Gandhi also had an office at Phoenix Farm, and he spent more time there than before because he needed the support of the natal Indians who far outnumbered the 13,000s of the Transvaal. At the farm, he led a chaste, frugal, Spartan existence. Except when it rained he slept in the open on a thin cloth. He eschewed all material pleasures, and concentrated on the coming battle. Asadya Grahi, he said, has to be, if possible, even more single-minded than a rope dancer. To the Johannesburg office and Phoenix Farm came a steady stream of Indians and whites. Gandhi's circle of friends was large. He attracted people and they usually remained loyal to him. Olive Schreiner, author of the story of an African farm and dreams, was one of Gandhi's best friends in Cape Colony. Love was written in her eyes, he said. Though she came of a rich, distinguished and learned family, she was so simple in habits that she cleansed utensils in her house herself, and did her own cooking and sweeping. Such physical labor, Gandhi helped, stimulated her literary ability. Color prejudice was repugnant to her. She lent her great influence in South Africa to the cause of fairness to Indians. So did her brother, Senator W. P. Schreiner, the Attorney General and, at one time, the Prime Minister of the colony, other prominent persons and high officials openly added Gandhi's movement. Many Christian clergymen supported him. They saw Satyagraha as Christianity in action against a system that merely called itself Christian. Gandhi worked through moral conversion. He preferred it to physical coercion and even to moral coercion. No true devotee of Christ could resist this. Christian editors Idealists and ministers atoned for the white man's sins by helping the little brown Hindu. Of all Gandhi's South African collaborators, Indian or white, the most intimate, he said, were Henry S. L. Pollock, Herman Kallenbach, an extremely wealthy Johannesburg architect, and Sonia Schlesen, who came from Scotland. Kallenbach was a tall, thick-set, square-headed German Jew with a long-handled burr mustache and pants nay. He met Gandhi by chance. A mutual interest in Buddhism brought them closer together, and thereafter, until Gandhi returned to India, they were inseparable. If anybody could be called Gandhi's second in command of the Satyagraha movement it was Kalanbach. Gandhi characterized him as a man of strong feelings, wide sympathies, and childlike simplicity. When Gandhi needed a private secretary and typist Kalanbach recommended Miss Schlesen, who was of Russian Jewish origin. Gandhi thought her noble and the finest person among his European associates. She wore boyish bobbed hair and a collar and necktie. She never married. Though she was young, Indian leaders went to her for advice, and the Reverend Doak, when he ran Indian opinion, liked her to comment on his editorials. Gandhi put her in charge of Satyagraha's treasury and books. For the financing of the resistance movement, Indians and Europeans in South Africa and Indians in India contributed considerable sums. Gandhi believed that an organization whose cause is just and impersonal, and which operates in full public view, will not lack money. He likewise believed in rigidly economical spending and scrupulous, detailed accounting. Suggestions poured in on Gandhi to raise the entire question of Indian disabilities in South Africa and to mobilize the whole Indian community of the continent. 
but he decided that it was against the principles of Satyagraha to expend or even to shift one's goal in the midst of battle. The issue was the right of Indians to live in and enter the Transvaal, nothing else. Gandhi now made the move of arresting and dramatic simplicity. A Parsi Indian from Natal named Sarabji Shaperji Adayania, who spoke English and had never visited the Transvaal, was chosen, at his own request, to test the bar on immigrants. He was to notify the government of his intentions, present himself at the Transvaal frontier station of Volksrust, and court arrest. But the border authorities let him in and he proceeded unmolested to Johannesburg. When their astonishment subsided, the Indians interpreted this development as a triumph. The government had refused to fight. Even when Sarabji was sentenced to a month's imprisonment for not leaving the Transvaal, their enthusiasm for the Gandhi method remained strong. It was accordingly decided that a number of English-speaking Indians in Natal, including Harilal, Gandhi's eldest son, who had returned from India, should enter the Transvaal. They were arrested at Volksrust and given three months in jail. The Transvaal Indians, Gandhi comments, were now in high spirits. The movement was now in full swing. The movement fed on prison sentences. Gandhi was besieged by people seeking permission to be arrested. He gratified the wish of some natal Indians. Transvaal Indians applied for the same privilege. They had only to tell the police that they had no registration certificates. Gandhi too was arrested and confined in the Volksrust prison. His prison card has been preserved by Manilo. It is cream colored and 2 and 7 eighths inches wide by 3 and 1 eighth. His name is mistakenly given as M.S. Gandhi instead of M.K. Gandhi. Trade, Solicitor. No alias. Sentence and date, 25 pounds or 2 months. October 10, 1908. Like all other Indians, Gandhi preferred prison to fines. Due for discharge, December 13, 1908. On the reverse side, under prison offenses, is a blank. He was a model prisoner. Gandhi had 75 compatriots with him in jail, and he became their cook. Thanks to their love for me, he wrote in a contemporary article, my companions took without a murmur the half-cooked porridge I prepared without sugar. In addition he performed hard labor, digging the earth with a shovel which blistered his hands. The blisters opened and caused pain. Once the warden wanted two men to clean the latrines, Gandhi volunteered. He had brought the suffering on himself and, by his agitation, on others. Would it not be better to pay the fine and stay at home? Such thoughts, Gandhi asserted, make one really a coward. Besides, jail has its good sides, only one warden, whereas in the free life there are many. No worry about food. Work keeps the body healthy. No vicious habits. The prisoner's soul is thus free and he has time to pray to God. The real road to happiness, Gandhi proclaimed, lies in going to jail and undergoing sufferings and privations there in the interest of one's country and religion. This account of life and reflections in jail ends with a quotation from Thoreau's famous essay on civil disobedience, which Gandhi had borrowed from the prison library. I saw Thoreau wrote, that if there was a wall of stone between me and my townsmen, there was a still more difficult one to climb or break through before they could get to be as free as I was. I did not feel for a moment confined, and the wall seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. As they could not reach any single quote, Thoreau continued, they had resolved to punish my body. I saw that the state was half-witted, that it was timid as a lone woman with her silver spoons, and that it did not know its friends from its focus, and I lost all my remaining respect for it and pitied it. Gandhi cherished this excerpt from Thoreau. He studied the entire essay. It has often been said that Gandhi took the idea of Satyagraha from Thoreau. Gandhi denied this in a letter, dated September 10, 1935, and addressed to Mr. P. Kodandara of the Servants of India Society. Gandhi wrote, The statement that I had derived my idea of civil disobedience from the writings of Thoreau is wrong. The resistance to authority in South Africa was well advanced before I got the essay of Thoreau on civil disobedience. But the movement was then known as passive resistance. As it was incomplete I had coined the word Satyakraya for the Gujarati readers. 
When I saw the title of Thoreau's great essay, I began to use his phrase to explain our struggle to the English readers. But I found that even civil disobedience failed to convey the full meaning of the struggle. I therefore adopted the phrase civil resistance. Nevertheless, Thoreau's civil disobedience essay did influence Gandhi. He called it a masterly treatise. It left a deep impression on Emmy single quote, he affirmed. There is the imprint of Thoreau on much that Gandhi did. Thoreau had read the Bake of Ada Gita and some of the sacred Hindu openness hats, so had Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was Thoreau's friend and frequent host. Thoreau, the New England rebel, borrowed from distant India and repaid the debt by throwing ideas into the world pool of thought. Ripples reached the Indian lawyer politician in South Africa. Henry David Thoreau, poet and essayist, was born in 1817 and died of tuberculosis at the age of 45. He hated Negro slavery and the individual slavery to the church, the state, property, customs and traditions. With his own hands he built him. Self a hut at Walden Pond outside Concord, Massachusetts, and dwelt there alone, doing all the work, growing his food and enjoying full contact with nature. Two years at Walden proved to Thoreau's own satisfaction that he had the courage and inner strength to be free in isolation. He accordingly returned to Concord to discover whether he could be free inside the community. He decided that the least he could do was not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn. So he refused to pay taxes and was imprisoned. A friend paid the tax for him, and Thoreau came out after 24 hours, but the experience evoked his most provoking political essay civil disobedience. The only obligation which I have a right to assume Thoreau declared in civil disobedience, is to do at any time what I think right. To be right, he insisted, is more honorable than to be law-abiding. Thoreau democracy was the cult of the minority. Why does the government not cherish its wise minority? He cried. Why does it always crucify Christ? It was 1849. Thoreau was thinking of Negro slavery and the invasion of Mexico. The majority which tolerated these measures was wrong, and he was right. Could he obey a government that committed such sins? He held that dissent without disobedience was consent and therefore culpable. Thoreau described civil disobedience in exact terms, as Gandhi understood it. I know this well, Thoreau wrote, that if one thousand, if one hundred, if ten men whom I could name, if ten honest men only, a, if one honest man, in this state of Massachusetts, ceasing to hold slaves, were actually to withdraw from this co-partnership, and be locked up in the county jail therefore, it would be the abolition of slavery in America. For it matters not how small the beginning may seem to be, what is once well done is done forever. But we love better to talk about it. There are thousands who are in opinion opposed to slavery and war who yet in effect do nothing to put an end to them, Thoreau continued. There are 999 patrons of virtue to every virtuous man. Thoreau despised professions without actions. He asked, how does it become a man to behave towards this American government today? I answer, that he cannot without disgrace be associated with it. His programmer was peaceful revolution. All men recognized the right to revolution, he wrote. That is, the right to refuse allegiance to, and to resist, the government, when its tyranny and efficiency are great and unendurable. This is why Gandhi was in jail at the very moment he read civil disobedience like Ruskin, Thoreau sought a closer correspondence between man's acts and man's goal. The artist in both required the integration of word and faith with deed. The great poet, the great artist has integrity. Millions had read Ruskin and Thoreau and agreed with them. Many Hindus had read them and agreed with them. But Gandhi took words and ideas seriously, and when he accepted an idea in principle he felt that not to practice it was dishonest. How can you believe in a moral or religious precept and not live it? The gulf between word and belief is untruth. The dissonance between creed and deed is the root of innumerable wrongs in our civilization. It is the weakness of all churches states, parties and persons. It gives institutions and men split personalities. In attempting to establish a harmony between words, beliefs and acts Gandhi was attacking man's central problem. 
He was seeking the formula for mental health. 